Okay, everybody, welcome to the Smart Sync workshop. Just going to wait a couple minutes for people to roll in. We have more than 400 people who have registered for this workshop. So there's going to be a couple people rolling in in just a few minutes. So give me about 100 seconds and we'll begin there. Please write where you're from in the chat and you can introduce yourself quickly. And just throughout the session, if you have questions, please write them in the chat. Um, at basically, Tiago Forte, who is on the call right now, he and I are going to be working together to, to moderate this. And so if Tiago is talking, I can help answer your questions. If I'm talking, Tiago can help answer the questions. And he's in Mexico City. I'm in Brooklyn. And look, we just want to make this as valuable for you as possible. We were basically just talking on Twitter a couple of weeks ago with a guy named Brian Norgard. And he said, hey, how do you take ideas from the internet and all the things that you read and then turn them into writing? And I said, Brian, you know, I will do a workshop for you and I'll just show you my entire system. And I learned this from Tiago, who teaches an excellent online course, which just truly changed my life called Building a Second Brain. And uh, this system is really derived from that. And then I came in and am now working on a writing school of my own called Rite of Passage. So that's a little bit about me and Tiago. I want to let you introduce yourself as well. Thanks, David. Good to see everyone here. I have an eye on the chat and we seem to have an extremely international bunch. <clears throat> And yeah, I just want to echo what David said in, in that, you know, we we're really here to serve like our, our attitude towards not just our businesses, but life is of service. We want people to thrive. We want them to succeed at whatever goals and dreams that they're, they're setting out to achieve. And the particular way that we've chosen to, to help that, because there's so many different ways, um, is through information. This, this, liquid, fungible, mysterious, and yet extremely practical and, and valuable thing that we're all swimming in these days. Um, and I hope what you'll get from this workshop today is a shifted perspective toward information from something that is chaotic and overwhelming and, and sort of um, just adds more to your plate and have that switch to just seeing information as this like magical, like almost like force that you can redirect and shape and capture and then unleash and then do all these really, really cool things with. Um, so we'll say more about what we're going to be doing, but um, that's me. And uh, thanks everyone for being here. One thing I will say is if you're in a place that you can turn on your video, um, this isn't your typical just one way webinar. We're going to have some interaction. We're going to answer your questions. We might ask some of you to unmute yourself and just speak so we can actually hear from you. Um, so if you're in a place where that's possible, I encourage you to turn on, on your video and also keep an eye on the chat. If you click the chat button on the toolbar, you can see everything going on there. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything really at all, just jump in the chat. And one of us will always have an eye on that. Absolutely. Yes. I just want to second that. Please turn on your chat. It makes it so much more fun when we can see everybody and just as a presenter and as a participant, it really makes this feel like a community. So we're gonna get right into it. And basically, Tiago and I have a thesis. And this thesis, it's kind of a life thesis because information is such a fundamental part of what it means to be somebody who's living in 2019. And it's that you should capture all the best ideas that you basically absorb. So whether you're reading books, articles, listening to podcasts, listening to audiobooks, reading a PDF, whatever it is, we believe that one of the ways that you can become an order of magnitude more efficient is just to capture ideas. Now that isn't just about saving ideas and saving notes and like, you know, like your old grandma's filing cabinet where you have to go get a ladder to go up to the top and then there's all these files and only one person really knows what that is. What we're saying is capture all the best ideas into a single place. And what's the benefit of that? Well, once all your ideas are in a single place, well, you can start to use search. And once you are capturing books and articles and whatever it is, and it's easily searchable, then all of a sudden you can begin to do superhuman things. I'll tell you just a little bit about what this system has given me is 
this year I am going to publish online the equivalent of roughly three and a half books worth of just written content. Whether that's through my email newsletter, whether that's through long form essays, I will publish more than 200,000 words. And I never write for more than 10 hours a week, never. So I don't really spend a lot of time writing, but this system has allowed me to be much more efficient than I would otherwise be. And I will tell you, I host a podcast called the North Star Podcast. I've interviewed New York Times bestsellers, top tier journalists, and I have never, never met somebody in journalism or who's an author who has a system that's as good as the one that we're about to give you. This is truly at the frontier of what is possible with information capture. And if you implement it well, it will absolutely change your life like it changed mine. Tiago, do you wanna talk about this idea that we're all curators now and then we can get into places to capture ideas? Yeah, that's part of the slides. Shall we just uh, go into the main part of the workshop? Yeah, let's roll. Let's do it. Okay, so this is the Smart Sync workshop, and really, we're you know we only have an hour together here, and we want to give you the most sort of practical value. Um, so we're going to be narrowing in on kind of the lowest of lowest hanging fruits when it comes to saving information, which is automatically saving your reading highlights. <laughs> and that can seem actually, as I'm reading it, overly specific. Like, wait, wait what? That's the thing. Um, but really, it's the lowest hanging fruit in that reading is really hard. I don't know if you've noticed this, but in the modern world where everything is delivered in bite-sized chunks, it takes a lot of energy to read. Um, and so when, assuming you are reading something, whether it's books or blog posts or articles or social media updates or websites or PDFs, any of the above, um, you've already done 99% of the work. All you have to do is that last 1% to just hit export, hit save, hit something and export something so that it's saved in what we call your second brain. And I know you may not be familiar with that term, but it comes from a course that I've been teaching in the past three years um, on digital note-taking, uh, otherwise known as personal knowledge management called building a second brain. And the idea is very simple. It's just that instead of spreading out the information and knowledge that you, that you find valuable in your life across a million different apps and platforms and folders and different things, centralize it in one place in a digital notes app where you have all of your knowledge and expertise at your fingertips ready to go for any project you wanna create, any piece of writing, any public speech, any even just for your own understanding and thinking. Um, so, and so that's what we mean by a second brain. And then there's kind of this transition that we've made over the past year or this development of a new course called Rite of Passage, which David teaches. That's really, okay, now that you have all this like incredible rich knowledge saved in one central easy to access place, what does the process look like to, to not just efficiently, but really powerfully and effectively turn that into writing? And, and, you know, David's credentials really are just his incredible output, not just the number of words, which, which is one thing, but the, the impact he's able to have with that writing, which is just incredible. Um, I have similar, I'm, I'm not sure I'm quite, quite at that volume, but I also publish a, a long form blog post every single week. Um, I, I pu publish the equivalent and actually then do self-publish an ebook every year. So really the, there's, a, there's an element here of becoming prolific. Like what does it take to actually become prolific? And what it actually begins with at least is what we call the capture habit. You know, we're constantly generating things all around us, um, generating notes and social media posts and we're listening to things and consuming things. And as I said, it just takes a little bit of intentionality and a little bit of setup to be able to save not the entirety of all these things, because that would be overwhelming, but the best parts, the best quotes, the best insights, the best facts, the best statistics, so that when you go into this notes app, it's, it's just like, it's a best of, it's like an all time best of knowledge of everything that you've, you've encountered. Um, and so let's, let's get into this. Um, David, I'll just go through curation and then, and then we'll pause and, and check in with people. 
Um, but basically, the, we, we always like to talk about the principle or the, the sort of big picture of what we're doing. Um, and here it's very simple. You know, there's, there's three kinds of information. There's information that is pushed to you. Um, this is notifications, pop-ups, uh, the little red badges, the little unread account on your email inbox. Um, everything where, every situation where someone else or some other company or organization is saying, we want you to read this or to consume this. Um, second is information that you pull. You decide, oh, I would like to learn about this now. I would like to hear about this now. I would like to know about that. And you pull it toward you. Um, and third is information that you create. And really, so with building a second brain, with, with kind of capturing your knowledge, we're making the transition from the first one to the second one, right? Instead of incoming information, just hitting you right on the cortex, just like this like tidal wave of information and you, you having no sort of uh, chance to make a decision about what you want to consume. We want to kind of create this buffer. We create this like this like safety zone between the, the chaos of the information world, the online world, and your delicate brain. Um, and that's what we're going to look at today is, is how do you just save things um, and then read them intentionally and save only the best excerpts. Um, and then with, with Rite of Passage and with writing in general, we look at the, the transition from the second one to the third one, which is then how do you turn around and create something out of that. So we're focused on that first transition today from type one to type two. And really the idea here is we want to escape the reactivity loop. You're, you're never going to find the best sources of information. You're never really going to grow your knowledge in the best way if you're just reacting. If you're always just reading whatever pops up in your feed, whatever someone you know, recommends in the moment, you really need to be a little more intentional about what you consume. And the way we like to think of this is a curator. Think of the curator of a, of a magazine who is only deciding you know, which articles and, and things make it into the magazine or the, the curator of a museum. They're, they're carefully choosing, really thinking about, okay, what do we want in the museum? What actually makes sense? What is gonna be helpful? Um, and really, you know, you, you, you might think of curation as public, but we want to start doing that just for yourself, like become your own curator. What, how can you make more strategic, more intentional decisions about your information diet rather than reacting? Um, and it's a pretty profound transi transition where you go from only focusing on things that are public to having sort of a private sphere where you can, you know, choose to just kind of digest something in your own time. Um, the transition also of becoming a curator makes you just kind of naturally focus less on novel things, what is just the, the immediate thing happening right now, and more on knowledge that is timeless, that stands the test of time. Um, you naturally find yourself focusing less on sensational things, more on subtle things. Once you've collected, say, 10 articles, you look at them and you notice, you know, oh, seven of these are just these sensational clickbait headlines. And then seeing everything in one place, you actually decide, no, I'm going to focus on the three that are not just kind of clickbait. Um, and really what, what really emerges from this process is you, you just spend less time consuming, right? There's this sort of like compulsive consuming thing that we do where we're, you know, we barely thought one second about what we just read and we're already reading something else. It's sort of like we're overstimulated and yet we want more stimulation. It's like that feeling of being full at the end of a meal, but you still wanna eat more. It's, it's not a great feeling. Um, and we, we, once we've collected all the, these notes and highlights together in one place, we go, oh my gosh, I have more than I, than I need. I have this wealth of, of information. Let me start digesting and creating and doing things with it. So let's start to get really practical here. Um, actually, let me pause before I give this example before we transition into the super practical stuff. David, is there anything you wanted to say or are there any questions for the chat? I think that one, I think that one thing that is very important, a mindset shift to begin to implement is the shift from knowledge as something that you just consume as if the more knowledge is always better, new, 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 more, 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 to actually thinking of knowledge as food. And if you can think of information as food, all of a sudden, your consumption choices will be a lot better. So we want to avoid things like sugar that are obviously bad for us that just give us a quick rush. What we want to do is be consuming 
some, some fish and some vegetables, more high quality information that actually helps us be healthier people. But then beyond that, you don't just eat food, you also digest it. And the reason why we believe so much that creating things is essential to the journey of building knowledge is because once you go through the process of creation, you then begin to make that information your own. And it's only once food actually begins to go through the digestive system and the nutrients are sorted out and stored in the body that we actually begin to benefit from our food. It's not when it enters our mouth. And this is fundamentally what this entire system from day one of building, and sec uh, building a second brain to the very last session of Rite of Passage is. It is a fundamental transformation of going from a pure passive consumer of the world to an active producer in it, to going from somebody who's just in the peanut gallery looking and gawking from the sidelines to somebody who's actively grappling with information and we believe that through this process, your rate of learning, your rate of career growth, and your, the quality of your thinking will improve dramatically. And it all starts with thinking of information as food. Yeah, that's awesome. I want to answer a couple of things here. Paraj, um, so for me, every knowledge, every kind of information has value. It's not that there's good things and bad things, social media, bad, long books on Greek philosophy, good. That's like a really dumb way of thinking of it. There is value in everything from the most sarcastic tweet. I do a lot of tweet, you know, kind of clever tweets. I love that all the way to the most timeless wealth of nations or whatever. The key, and this is why we're focusing here on curation, is within a given piece of information, how do you pull out the one or two or a hundred or a thousand, whatever it is, best points. I'll often read, say, a book or be on a website and take notes on what not to do. Like, oh my gosh, this is the worst website I've ever seen. And I'll be up there like, oh, capturing, okay, don't do this. Don't have headlines like that. Don't use these colors. Those are some of my most valuable notes. So when you think of curation, don't just think about entire sources. Think about within a different source. How can you learn and how can you gain value from absolutely anything that you consume? Um, and then for Andrew, you know, it's, it's a bit funny because we're, we're talking very fast. I can even hear myself because we're trying to summarize like, two more than month long courses in 60 minutes. <laughs> so that process that you're describing of how to turn informa raw information all the way to creative outputs is, is really more than we can cover today. Um, but we're gonna give you, you know, links to and a couple discount codes for those two courses at the end. Uh, and we encourage you to join us. It's really a, it's a journey. Like, like we, we, this is why we don't say these courses are like easy or quick. They really take some investment, but you gain a system and skills that will serve you your entire life. Absolutely. Uh, Tiago, there's been so many questions about Evernote and Notion. Can you very quickly describe how you see the differences between those two things and why for today we're going to focus on Evernote when it comes to information capture? Totally, yes. So. Evernote, which is evernote.com, um, is a probably the most popular note-taking application. Note-taking in the sense that it's casual, it's free form, it's not highly structured, it's not a database, there's no official, you know, formal anything really. It's just you create notes and you drop them in this thing called an inbox and you sort those notes into different notebooks. Um, and then Notion, which is I believe notion.so, <clears throat> if someone could put links to those in the chat, I'd appreciate it, is different. It's part of an emerging uh, kind of category of, of productivity that doesn't really have a name yet. I've called it the productivity dashboard uh, category, but it's basically when you have certain kinds of information that need more structure, which just happens, right? Like everything you're working on goes through a process from being immature to being immature. You know, let's say you have a, a checklist in your business for how to run certain processes, or you have an employee manual, or even just you personally, you have a checklist for how you write blog posts, or you have a database of your contacts, like a personal CRM, like all the above are examples where you need a little bit more structure than a note-taking app can provide. 
And that's really what Notion and similar apps are focused on is having a little more like you can have linked databases, you can have sort of a document with different modules like a gallery, a checklist, a Kanban board, things that are a little more, a little, a tiny bit heavier and more structured, but that give you a lot of new capabilities. Um, so I really, I use both of them almost equally. Evernote is, like I said, free form capture. Notion is more structure and process. Um, I noticed someone put the link to my office hours on Friday. Really encourage you to check that out. I'll be showing you exactly how I use Notion, which is highly complimentary. I really don't see those two apps as, as in conflict in any way. Um, they're highly complimentary and I, I really recommend both. And uh, but we'll be covering PDF. In fact, that's a good transition. Shall we, shall we get into the demos? Let's rock and roll, sir. Okay, so real quick here, just an example is like, you come across a tweet and it's so easy. This, this is on, you know, one of these, the, the endless list of controversial topics, you know, whether they're gonna pay athletes. It's so easy to just hit retweet, add a clever comment, a sarcastic, you know, confirming your existing beliefs, confirming your biases, you know, agreeing with all the things you already agree with. But there's something else you can do. You know, you might still be on Twitter. I spend a lot of time on Twitter. But instead, you save that thing. And the example on the right is, is a, a free tool called the Web Clipper that's made by Evernote that allows you to clip just the content on a page that you want to keep. So imagine instead of that instantaneous reaction, you, you clip this. You know, you save it to a notebook where you start to gather different points of view, different kinds of research, a for and against, pro and con. You actually start to build like a model of this topic that can be looked at from different angles, that can be written about, that you can share with others, that you can structure in different ways. You know, that really is a more mature and powerful way of relating to information rather than this just instantaneous one-off thing. So we wanna look at the three sort of usual suspects when it comes to information capture. And this is just from our experience. Um, the, the kind of person that even cares about information capture and information management <laughs> um, tends, to, tends to consume eBooks, tends to consume online articles or blog posts, and just in general web pages. Um, and then I think there's a bonus one. We'll also, also show you PDFs. Um, but let me just show you what these look like. And these are going to pass fast because, as I said, this is just the last 1%. So pay close attention. But <clears throat> this is an example on the Amazon Kindle app on the iPad. Um, works similarly on other tablets and even on the, just the Kindle device. But basically, if you didn't know, you can, you can make highlights. And the way you do, that, do this is as you're reading, you just put your finger down and you just click and drag like this. And whatever you drag over will be made yellow is the default color. You can also do different colors. If you tap the screen and then hit that icon in the top right, it will show you a full list of all your highlights. You can kind of look through them. Then if you hit share, you can choose what style you want to export it. It generates an email. And the email has the, the title of the book and then just an attachment with the um, with all those, with just those highlights. So here's the thing, it's not exporting the whole book, right? No book has, you know, solid gold in every single paragraph. Usually there's like 2%, 5%, maybe 10% at most, if it's an outstanding book that is really worth keeping. Um, and that's what's being exported. So all the rest you're leaving behind. If you need to refer to the full source text, you have that Kindle ebook forever and on any device. Um, that's always available there for you, but really you just want to save the, the choice little morsels of insight. Um, so what you do here is most note-taking apps like, like Microsoft OneNote, um, Evernote, Notion have what's called a capture email address. It's basically a custom email address that anything you send to that gets added to your account. So I would save that address to your contacts and then right there where it says to, just put in, I think I have mine under Evernote capture, just start typing that, it autofills, you hit send, and within seconds, it appears in your Evernote inbox. And that, that by the way, doesn't require any special setup. You don't need any special integrations. It's a, it's a completely built-in feature of um, the Kindle app. And similar thing with uh, Apple Books. Between the two of them, those have like, I think, 98% of the ebook market. Let's look at online articles. So you might read blog posts, essays, long form, you know, in-depth articles, whatever it is. 
And for this, I really recommend um, Instapaper. Instapaper is a free app. It's in the category of what I call read later apps, which is just basically, you know, if you're like me, you go through your day, you probably get 50 recommendations or links. You know, if you get David's newsletter, he gives you many, many different links every Monday to read. And in the middle of your workday, there's no way you have the time to just stop your, you know, your active projects and work on that. Um, so really it's, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a waiting room. You send anything you, you want to read, you might want to read, you're not sure if you want to read, you just hit one button and Instapaper has integrations with all the, the usual browsers and things and it gets saved in, in this app. Then later, I usually do mine in the evening or at lunch, during meals or if I'm at the airport or on the subway, some time where I have some free time. Instead of you know, jumping on social media, I open up my, my Instapaper app and I see it's almost like a personalized magazine of everything that I've saved. Um, and here's what it looks like. So let's say this is a website, you know, someone you know, texts it to you and you're like, okay, I'm in the middle of the street. I'm not gonna read this thing right now. All you have to do is hit the share button. So you might look through it briefly and decide, okay, this is something I wanna save. You hit share, there's the Instapaper share button. It says saved, great, now it's saved. So when you head over to the app and sync, just takes just a second, you see everything you saved. If you tap that article and you decide you wanna read it, all you have to do to make a highlight, very, very similar to Kindle, is highlight whatever is the passage and then hit that middle highlight button. You'll see it pop up there briefly. It looks like a, a highlighter pen. And you can do as much or as little as you want. I sometimes do, you know, one sentence in an entire 5,000 word article. And other times it's like every paragraph, whatever you feel is appropriate. And then it's automatically synced to Evernote within seconds. And this one does take a little bit of setup. And it's another free service called IFTTT, uh, which is an acronym for If This Then That. If you search for this one you see in front of you, just search, go to IFTTT.com. If someone would put that in the chat, I'd appreciate it. Uh, search, do a search for Append Instapaper Highlights to Evernote. And all that does, you'll have to like sign into Instapaper and then sign into Evernote. It sort of connects the two. It's like a bridge. It's like, a, it's like, a, it's like an integration. Uh, once that's turned on, every single highlight that you make in Instapaper will automatically show up in Evernote. So this one does take a little bit of setup. Uh, let me show you a couple more and then we'll pause for another, another break. Um, sometimes it's not an article, it's, but it's a website, right? It's, it's a, a product page, it's a launch page, it's a company site. I mean, think how often, I don't know about you, but I'm always, always, always trying to find models. You know, I never want to create anything from scratch. If I'm creating a new page for one of my products, I want to find the best model I can find and then just, you know, kind of copy them, not rip them off, but use them as a starting point. Um, and this is another free tool that you can use called GetLiner. That's getliner.com. And what it does is it, is it integrates with your browser and then it turns your, your cursor into essentially an, a web highlighter. So all you have to do once you've installed the Chrome extension is click that button in the top right corner. This little thing comes up and then you just highlight anything you wanna save, just like a highlighter. Um, once you've, you're finished, you just hit share and you can see it has built-in export options for you know, many of the, the usual suspects. I'm gonna click Evernote and then within a few seconds, once I've synced, there is the, the excerpt. And what's cool is I can now, summarize even further. I can bold say the specific part within that excerpt that I think is most relevant and then I can share it. You know, this is really cool. Think of how often someone sends you an article. They're like, oh, I think this would be really relevant to you. I don't know about, I don't know about you, but I'm usually like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to read this whole thing, especially if it's really long. With this, you can share just the part and the part within the part that you think is most relevant to a, a client, to a colleague, to a peer, to a friend. It's really like a more, much more targeted and effective way of sharing content. And then one more as a kind of bonus, um, we have a lot of people who read PDFs um, who take our courses, often they're scientists, researchers, doctors, um, clinicians, they work in the pharmaceutical industry. There's, there's unfortunately quite a lot of quite precious knowledge that's still trapped in PDFs. Um, 
but we can work with that. There's a, there's an app called PDF expert. Um, it's very similar to many other apps. You don't have to use that one, but once I've installed it on my iPad, as I'm reading, uh, very similar to the other examples, I can just select, um, if I find a checklist or some cool, you know, points that I want to save, I can make them highlighted, even add my own commentary, which is a good idea. You know, why you find that valuable, why you're saving it, why it's worth keeping. Then similar process, you can see it's a pattern, hit export, hit Evernote. I can add a title if I want. Then if we head over to Evernote, it's saved as an attachment. And the cool thing is you can still search within that. So first of all, the highlights are preserved. So if you come back to this PDF at a later time, you'll see the same highlights there. <coughs> And then you might wonder, well, how will I even remember these are here? Well, the, the full text of these PDFs is available and searchable um, because you're keeping all of this in one place. That's, that's the real advantage here. You, know, you don't really get this if your PDFs are in folders in your file system, but you do get it if um, they're saved in one app. Um, you also have an option with PDF Expert to actually just export the highlights into like their own Evernote notes so that they're not stuck inside the PDF. Um, and I think that's the paid version of PDF Expert. Um, one more thing here, and then we're gonna take questions before we, we kind of um, move on here. There is a way, so the, the methods I've shown you are all free. And that's important. When you first dip your toes in the water here, you're sort of not sure if this is gonna work for you. You're not sure how in depth you're gonna go. You're not sure you know, how often you're really gonna be doing this. And I recommend you start with free, with free options. But just in the past year or two, um, this company called Readwise, we don't really have, we don't have a financial relationship with, with them. We, we don't really have a partnership. Uh, we just really like them. Um, but they've really arisen in a, in a really cool way to kind of solve this problem. Basically, if you pay their fee, which is five bucks a month, um, they do all this for you. Essentially, every ebook that you highlight on the Kindle will be automatically synced to a dedicated notebook in Evernote. You don't have to do that, you know, view, highlights, export thing. Uh, and same thing with Instapaper. Everything you highlight in Instapaper will, it will create a dedicated note for each article with only those highlights. And that's also automatic. Uh, and actually, just in the past month or two, they've come out with web highlighting. So you could even do the thing I showed you with the web highlighting using Readwise. Um, and if you think about, you know, five bucks, that's a couple coffees, you know, that's a, it's a, it's a iTunes, uh, TV episode. What would it be worth to, to be able to save the best of what you're already consuming without having to think about it at all, to have it be completely, completely hundred percent automated. Okay. David, what's what's been, what's been happening here behind the scenes? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I've been uh, I, I've been typing away back here. Lots of good questions. I think that there's two really good ones. Um, the first one is let's talk about well three good ones. The first one is screenshots. I will talk about what I do, and then Tiago, you can chime in. So a couple times a week, I go in and I save different screenshots on my phone, and then I upload them all to my computer, and I do a bit of a clunky process of putting them into different Evernote notebooks. I wouldn't recommend doing that at the beginning until you feel like this is really gonna be good and a worthwhile long-term investment. So the screenshots is still a little bit clunky, but you can also use that Evernote web clipper and that streamlines the process on your desktop. In terms of old paper books, classic paper books, look, I think that there's two good solutions. The first one is take a photo of that paper book and crop it down and then you can add it to your note taking system as a screenshot. That works very well. The second one, which I do sometimes, this is a bit of an expensive solution, but look, in, information is so integral to our lives. And if you come across a piece of information that's important, I actually do think it's worth the money. What I'll do is if a book is on, on Kindle and in paperback, what I'll do is, here, I'll show you. So, so I'm reading right now this book called The Dream Machine. And uh, it's, the, it's a biography of, of Licklider, who was very 
influential in the early days of computing. And so I just like reading the paperback. It's fun to flip through the book. I have a much better relationship with the book when I actually read it here. And then I also purchased the Kindle. And so what I will do is I will read the book next to the, the Kindle. And then if I come across something, I'll highlight. And then it just automatically saves into my second brain. Another thing that you can do is you can listen to an audiobook and then you can also buy the Kindle. And Amazon has an amazing piece of technology. It's probably, it's seriously one of their most underrated pieces of technology called WhisperSync. And what it will do is it will automatically sync what you're hearing with what you're reading. And so the app of Audible automatically syncs with with the Kindle app, and then you can listen to your audiobook inside the Kindle app, and that really helps for saving notes over, over time. There was uh, one other question that I want to just answer before Tiago talks a little bit about Evernote Notion, and that was this idea of, well, why don't we just directly save everything into Evernote? Like, it's a good question, right? Like, well, if we just want all of our best information to be there, why don't we just save it all there in the first place? Like, what are you doing using Liner and Instapaper? And here's the answer. You do not, you do not want to save everything into Evernote. That's not the point. Evernote is like a curated place where you know that only the best things that you've consumed are, which virtually guarantees that when you come across something in Evernote, it's going to be good. And I will tell you, because we have this idea around information hoarding, where we never want to lose something, like kind of like a fear of missing information instead of fear of missing out. Look, I get it. But I challenge you and, and, and I strongly recommend as somebody who has spent years doing this and worked with hundreds of students, do not save everything into Evernote. Do not. You will absolutely regret it. Work with Instapaper, work with Liner, work with Kindle, and only save the best things. That way, you can keep your note-taking system clean and you'll ensure that everything in it is of high quality. Yeah, so <clears throat> I've been schooled here on what exactly is included on the free version of Evernote. Uh, I don't think, I think you're right, PDF searching and emailing to yourself is not included in the free plan. Um, so what I would say there is, I think it's something like $40 a year. Is that the current price for premium? There, there's two paid tiers for Evernote. And I would just say, I mean, if, if you're going to spend even the most minimal involvement here, it's it's one of those investments that is just like, you know, even if you use it on one project, you use it on, on half a dozen books, you save just a handful of articles, you've paid for that many, many times over. Um, and there probably is, I mean, there's, there's always some hacker who figures out a free way to do things. There probably is still a free way to save those. Um, actually, I can probably even think of it. You could email that, that little HTML attachment of your highlights to yourself. You could open that up in your web browser. You could copy that page and then you could paste it into Evernote there. That's the free way. But really it's like, if, you're, if your time is worth more than about 50 cents an hour, then please don't do that. <laughs> Tiago, can you talk a little bit about Evernote Notion? Just like, why are we saying you should capture an Evernote? What, what's wrong with Notion? Notion's the hot new startup. It's clearly what people are most excited to use. Why are you being this old cranky guy and saying, look, you got to come back to Evernote. It's driving me crazy. Yeah. So it's, it's really, let's see how to answer that best. You know, my second brain has, has changed platforms multiple times. You know, I started at the very beginning, it was on paper after, after a couple of years, uh, it, it was then in Microsoft Word. This was like almost 10 years ago, right? I just had one massive Microsoft Word document. At some point I switched to Google Docs, right? And then at some point I switched to Evernote. So I just assume every two to four years, two to five years, I'm gonna switch platforms. But that not only, is a, not only isn't a big deal, it's just like a natural expected evolution of technology, right? Like technology changes. You wanna take advantage of new capabilities. So. I'm not even saying, you know, at some point I might switch to Notion or I'm sure in six months there will be the next thing that says it's going to kill Notion. It's like, 
Like what I really, the way I would answer that is I would encourage you to just like elevate your perspective from being so fixated on the tool. You know, that, that really is a recipe for heartbreak if you fall in love with any tool. Like if you've been in the productivity app space, you remember Mailbox, you remember Sunrise, like every year there is a beloved productivity app that goes bankrupt, that fails, that gets acquired or gets shut down. Do not get attached to any single tool. It's gonna have to change many, many times over the years. Really elevate your perspective to things that, um, that stand the test of time, such as like publishing. You know, when you publish a blog post, when you publish books, those are like these artifacts. It's like you create this like crystal of insight that, that really stands the test of time. Um, and don't get too fixated on the particular features of any one. That said, um, I think the two, like I said, are highly, are highly complementary. You know, information, especially text and also images, can very easily be moved from one place to another. Um, that's why I, I, I really recommend just focusing on capturing the best things, because once you have the best things, you'll send them to Photoshop. You'll send them to Medium. You'll send them to Figma. I mean, I use every app under the sun, but the only the, the one that I consider my second brain that is 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 sort of the source of all the insights that make all those things worthwhile is my notes app. And that's where I, I recommend you, you invest. Tiago, I'm just gonna sort of push you a little bit more there. Is there something about the how easy it is to actually capture things on Evernote, the fact that Evernote is the industry standard, the fact that you can pay for it, we know that it's still gonna be around in a couple of years. And even though the user experience is a bit clunky, like we have seen with more than a thousand students among us, we have seen that Evernote works really, really well. Yeah, I think the, the really key capability of notes is that you can capture without having to make any decisions. Like that, that I cannot emphasize that enough. You know, like I've been doing this, this is my way of life. And still very often I'm like, oh, the effort to open the app and the save the thing and copy. It's like, it's like the, the you're so, the, the, the decision of whether to capture or not is already so difficult that if you have to make any decisions, it's just a, it's, it's a, it's a kind of a deal breaker. And this is what I noticed with Notion. You know, Notion, you, 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 you could just save something in a random page and decide it later. But with Evernote, it's, like the, it's kind of sort of like this black box. You just have this box with a slot in it. And every thought is like a coin. You're just like, bam, bam, bam. You don't have to think about what is this going to be called? How am I going to use it? Which page does this go into? Which, even which notebook, even that decision can be made later. And I find, you know, every, like, let me just show you, every day, been a light day but if we see so here's my Evernote if we look in oh, if we look in all notes you know I'm saving oops oh every day you know three to sometimes like five to some days probably three to five three to seven notes a day Right. And if I had to stop for each one of these and decide where in, in which linked database on which sub page of which page in Notion I had to decide, it would be absolutely a no, just a no go. Um, what I like being able to do is if I look in Notion. So I have here my Praxis workflow with all the different posts that I'm working on. I like in, say, the ultimate four day Oaxaca itinerary. <laughs> which is a post I'm going to publish at some point that I can just have one link. You know, I can manage this here and, and move it from one column to another as it goes through my workflow. But when it comes to the actual content, it's here in Evernote. Yeah, this is classic, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this comp like, this is stuff, I don't want this to be managed in Notion. This is messy, this is random, it's, there's mistakes, there's weird formatting. I want my Notion to be like about execution, like a dashboard, you know? Um, and so having Notion be that structured dashboard allows Evernote to be almost this like, like think of the paper notebook, like open up a paper notebook. Do you expect like perfectly, you know, perfect grid of everything and perfect, no, you expect like crazy, like little scribbles and random things and arrows. That's, that's really the messiness that I like. Tiago, you want to move into the next section of what this actually looks like from a writing perspective? <clears throat> um, 
Yeah. So the last thing I'll have you do that if you want to get that set up, but you yeah. know, David kind of emphasized keeping only the best. And this is a hard mindset for people we've noticed to have. You feel like you're losing something. When you save that one passage from that article, you go, oh, but the rest of the article, there's this FOMO that kicks in. Oh, but there could be maybe maybe the story that I don't think is useful will be useful. Or that fact that I, I'm not saving now will be um, something valuable. But you can't live life that way. You just it, It's like being a hoarder. You know, if you, if you hoard in your house, you may have every last thing you ever you know, could ever want to, to, to use again, but your house is going to be unlivable. Same thing with your creative process. If you save everything, your creative process is going to be absolutely insurmountable. It's going to be just too much to deal with. So here's some criteria for what to keep, you know, when something inspires you, that's something you can't search on Google for something that inspires me personally right now right? That, that is, that is a, a difficult thing to find. But when I need inspiration, you know, and, and that's not just like the motivational speech kind of inspiration, but inspiration like, oh my gosh, I need to like redesign, uh, you know, the, uh, the checklist for my coaching client. Gosh, that's so hard to do from scratch. Let me use another checklist from another coach that I found, you know, six months ago. Um, something that's useful. So, so really think of your notes as building blocks. Right, like everything you might want to create from the tiniest little, you know, memo document to a huge whatever um, is going to be made of parts. Right, everything is made of parts. If you can have those parts pre-formed, pre-made, pre-vetted, pre-captured, that will save you a tremendous amount of work. Work, and this actually relates to to the end of building a second brain, where we talk about just-in-time productivity. Where once you have enough of these building blocks around you, you start to realize oh my gosh, I can just snap together like Legos, a dozen of these pieces and deliver something that would have taken me months of work to do. It's really a remarkable um, kind of superpower. Um, third things that are, I think, oh, third, easily lost. So something, you know, if you have your, your, I don't know, user's manual for your car, you don't really need to save that in your notes. Just put it in some predictable place, like, you know, underneath your seat in your car or in the garage. But there's these things, you know, like a quote on writing from an 18th century philosopher. Like there's no clear place for that to go that you're going to know where to find it. That kind of ambiguous stuff is the kind of stuff you want to keep in your second brain. Stuff that would otherwise get lost. That is, that is ambiguous, uncertain, weird, random, unexpected. And fourth, personal. Like this is a big one that people miss. When you learn something. You know, when you do a project, when you finish a project, take like five, like I can't emphasize this enough, take five minutes and just make a note. What did I learn? What did I do well? What could I have done better? Um, you know, just, just a little quick mini personal retrospective over time as you come across those and you sometimes turn them into other things like blog posts, 10 things I learned from my job in consulting or, you know, three ways to, uh, to work with a personal assistant, whatever it is, those are going to be things that are unique to you. That's your competitive advantage. You know, that's, that's wisdom, not just knowledge, but personal wisdom that you've gained through hard won experience. Um, so I think with that, I'll turn it over to you, David. We, we want to, as we're approaching the end here, show you what this really, really looks like. Like when David or I sit down to write, what does it actually look like? Yeah, so this is basically how I'm able to write so much, and I'm going to show you what an outline actually looks like. And to prove to you that I have not planned this one bit or thought about what we're going to do together, I am only going to search things that you have dropped in the chat, meaning I'm going to need participants, participation from all of you in the next 10 minutes while I do this. And I'm going to show you how fast I can create an outline. So I'm going into my screen now. And basically, what we are going to do is we are going to basically look through my notes. And if you see any idea that is interesting to you, um, just throw the idea in the chat. I'm not going to search anything until I get a word and I'm just going to pick the words that I think are interesting. So drop ideas, whether you coordination, beautiful. Okay. CPG. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. So here's my CPG, um, innovation. So let's see. Um, future of CPG. 
how's this? The food industry is transforming before our eyes. So we can, oh, this looks interesting. Research and development. Okay, let's see what else is in here. CPG, China. Oh, that'll be interesting. Okay. Um, let's just add China and commerce. And as you can see, just all these ideas come up and they just randomly come in here. Let's see, Taobao villages. No, that doesn't look particularly interesting. Okay, let's see. Oh, five big Chinese carriers and, um, and then Chinese ports. So, so I'm thinking of some kind of thesis around CPG industry relationships between China and America. So now please only suggest ideas that fall into that theme so we can get a little bit more specific. Why don't we just talk about Shenzhen? Tariffs. Um, let's see. Oh, this looks interesting. Um, so we'll start with a history of Shenzhen. And we can throw in these two quotes right here. And then we can talk about the current Chinese economy, the modern Chinese economy. And we can bring this in. Okay. Now we want something nice. Ooh, this is a great one right here. Let's see, manufacturing. China, let's see what comes up. Barrage, that was a great recommendation. Um, let's see, I need another word. Well, let's do tariffs. Nice, this looks good. Industrial capacity manufacturing, that might be helpful for later. Oh, this is great. Total U.S. manufacturing, so state of the American economy. And let's see, intellectual property. That's great. Thanks, Glenn. So as you can see, we've been doing this for three minutes and we already have the, the basics of a serious post here. So let's see, intellectual property, we'll add China just to keep things on point. Please keep the ideas coming, the more the merry, that way you can just pick the best ones. Oh, wow, look at this. And then we can talk about the relationship between China and the US. Oh, that's a great quote, great stat. So yeah, I'm just looking for statistics and other ways now to boost credibility. And if you begin to see some themes emerging and you think that there is a thesis that we can begin to bring in with all these facts on the left side of the screen, please let me know and then we can begin to compile an, uh, an outline around that thesis. Let's see. Wow, it's a crazy stat. What's wild about this is I don't remember reading the vast majority of these things. So all this is random. I just have hundreds and hundreds of notes that I can borrow from. And now you can see this, this coming in. I will share the outline with you. Um, but I would love to hear if any themes begin to come to mind for you. History of Shenzhen. Okay, so now let's just transition into CPG and China. Let's see that kind of that, that original idea. No. Oh, this will be good. Wow. That's a great stat.
let's see, CPG, China. Just gonna go into my CPG folder. We can see if there's any trends. Oh, I like that. Outsourcing transportation and logistics. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of compile a list of CPG trends down here, and then we can find some, we can string together some kind of narrative between, between China and CPG. Perfect. This looks great. So what I would do is this is sort of the thesis that's emerging for me. It's something like big consumer CPG, big American consumer CPG companies used to innovate in house. Now they're, and we can use, use this, we could say, and we can look at this. Now they're outsourcing research and development. Um, products are increasingly made across in China, even if they're designed in America. The shift in manufacturing from America to China is reshaping the world economy and has profound consequences for the future of American industry. So I think that honestly, that is right there. I mean, that's nine minutes of creating this thing and for the average person, that would probably take a couple hours. Um, and I just, I had all of that right there. And if I spent the next 50 minutes, just five, zero minutes, I would have an article totally complete. Um, and those were just excerpts of things that I found interesting when I was writing, different ideas that stuck out for whatever reason or another. Honestly, I hadn't, I didn't remember ever reading 80% of that. And so basically what I'm doing when I read is I'm saving notes for my future self so that at any moment in the future, if you give me any, any content, I can then spin up the best of information. And now you might ask, well, why wouldn't you just Google that? And this is the thing. Google will never, ever, ever give me content that's as personalized, targeted, and high quality of what, as what I just found. Everything in my Evernote is of ultra high quality because I have multiple layers of how I get things in there. I am ruthless about making sure that my information filters are top notch. So I only want really good content coming to me. Then out of that content, I only save the very most interesting things. Then out of that, I only actually highlight and put into my Evernote the very best of the very best of the very best. And so then in nine minutes, I can create something that would take just your ordinary author or journalist a couple of hours. And it's just because of this system, which we've just given you here right now. And so, to begin to wrap up, this is the process of information capture, save it all in Evernote, and then you can write just like we do. And if you're interested in doing this, I am starting my next rite of passage cohort on November 6th. This is about 5% of what rite of passage is, probably less. And I would love for you to join. 
you're going to learn how to do all of this. And then you are also going to be doing this with a community of many, many people who are all trying to write with you. And um, Tiago, if you could drop a link to the Rite of Passage website, that would be fantastic. But I would love for you to join me and I will show you all of this and then help you to improve your creative process. Um, and really just building off, building a second brain and what we went through today, what we did today was, was, was 5% of what you can do with this system, probably less. And I, I really mean it when I say having this note taking system is absolutely transformative in what you can achieve in small nuggets of time. And you can be more productive and spend less time working. You can produce more and have more freedom away from the computer. And that's what we're all going for in life. We want all this information to turn from a source of anxiety to a source of strength. And this system is how we do that. Yeah, so we're gonna wrap up on time here, but I put in uh, both the websites for our two courses as well as $100 off discount links. We rarely discount. You know, these are, this is, each of these is a month long intensive boot camp. It's not like a bunch of videos that you just, you can watch them on your own time if you want. We have a self, you know, they're, they're self paced if you like to do it that way. But really, I recommend you join a live cohort, which we schedule a few times a year. Um, it, where you're getting a ton of coaching, a ton of feedback, really specific answers to your specific questions. So we don't do deep discounting ever. Uh, and really, we don't discount when we do more than $100. So this is the best deal you're going to see. Um, and you know, we release new versions of the course every few months. Bling a second brain is on version nine. It's the ninth iteration with big changes and improvements every time. I think Rite of Passage is on version three. Uh, and you get with Rite of Passage, if you get the premium tier, you get lifetime access to all future versions. Uh, and I encourage you to, to just choose the option that's right for you. Yeah. November 6th, Rite of Passage begins. I hope I'll see you there. Thank you all for your time. It was great seeing you today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Thanks for showing up.